Believer's Clarity of Purpose. So I want to begin with clarity. What does that mean? Being clear and intentional about the things you want to accomplish in life, that is the clarity of purpose. To be clear and to be intentional about the things that we as believers want to accomplish in life. But for Christian believers, our purpose should be in line with God's purpose. We must align our purpose with the will and the purpose of God. We do not live by our purposes alone. We must include God's divine guidance. Now I read from Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21, which says, many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. The truth is, God has a purpose for your life, and there is absolutely nothing, any force can do about it or stop it. Anything can do to stop it. You know, absolutely nothing, no one, no force on earth, underneath the earth, above the earth, can stop the purpose of God from coming to fruition in your life. So we must be clear about that. Now, the other thing is when we talk about purpose, let's dig in and, and find out what is the purpose for believers. You know, the best example that we can find to illustrate the clarity of purpose for believers is Jesus. In the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus says, the thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come, Jesus, I have come that they, believers, may have life, and that they, believers, may have it more abundantly. So Jesus has a clear purpose. In the context of this passage in John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus is described as the good shepherd who always takes care of his sheep his flock. He takes care of his people. He wants them to experience abundant life. See, God wants us believers to have a rich tapestry of experiences. He blesses our lives with adventures. I mean, sometimes it's up, sometimes it's down, but they all walk together for good for those that love God and are called according to his purpose. Now, the prophet Jeremiah also says in Jeremiah 29 verse 11, a very familiar verse of scriptures, for I know the plans that I have for you, speaking of God the Father, declares the Lord, the plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. See, not only does God have a purpose for our life, it is a purpose that is filled with a hope and a future. See, so God's, the clarity of purpose must begin with the understanding, with the mindset that God wants you to have a rich tapestry of experiences, an abundant life. And secondly, it is a life that's interlaced with hope, a blessed hope and a future. So we begin with those premise. So the question now becomes, how do we believers individually, how do we locate our um, purpose. How? So locating our purpose is an extremely uh, 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 mystifying thing for young believers. Because how do I find my purpose? You know, some people say, what is my calling? How do I know what God has called me to do? Let's begin with Proverbs 16.3. It says, commit your work to the Lord and your thoughts and plans will be established. When you commit your work to the Lord, he will establish his purpose in your life. Now you say, but how? how? How is this? Now your work doesn't have to be a work in the ministry. It could be a secular work. It could be an activity. It could be a profession. It could be a vocation. It could be a calling. You could be uh, committing your work as a plumber to the Lord. You could be committing your work as a driver to the Lord. You could be work, committing your work as an accountant to the Lord. So the, the, it is profession agnostic, is vocation agnostic. It is committing your work to the Lord. See, God's purpose or calling is located in his word and in your walk. Let me repeat that. 
God's purpose or calling for your life as a believer is located in his word and in your walk. So which means that in order for you to find your purpose, you have to read the word of God. You have to commit yourself to reading the word of God with understanding. And in your walk, your fellowship with him, you have to be committed to following the commandments, you know, the precepts, the ordinances, all of the things that God wants you to do. You have to be committed to doing that. And as you walk with him, as you read his word, his purpose, his plans, his thoughts for your life will be established. Colossians chapter 3 verse 17 says this, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, all your might, as though you were working for the Lord, not human masters. It is some of us get caught up with who our immediate supervisors are. You know, they are abrasive. They're not nice people. They're not kind. They're not, you know, and we get caught up and, and this corporate, uh, corporate is treating us bad. The conditions are not good. Uh, you know, and we get caught up in, in, in these, you know, uh, mundane things, but we forget that we are working for God. You know, that means that in the middle of a difficult conflict, a hard work situation, a challenging marriage, perhaps, a career that has taken a turn downward, whatever it is, you can still be at the center of God's purpose for your life by choosing a good attitude and by remembering that you are serving God instead of people. You can move toward your purpose and God sees you as faithful when you serve him in the mundane and he will bring, you know, and then challenging things of life, he can trust you with more. So locating your purpose doesn't mean that you have to be at the altar, at the church, in the, in the holies of holies. You could be anywhere in the world as long as you commit your work, whatever activity you are engaged in, to the Lord, and you do it as though he were your supervisor and your master, that would bring you into God's purpose for your life. It will be clearer as we move on. You know, so as you locate your purpose, you have to walk with God. And a second thing that is extremely important is the notion of the adversary. Now understand this, this is where a lot of people get deceived. We have a real adversary, the thief, Satan, the father of all lies, comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Contrary to the purpose of God, Jesus, the thief, who is also Satan, has a different purpose. And that is to steal, kill, and destroy. In John chapter 10, verse 10, it says the thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. So we should be aware that Satan has a clear purpose, which is the you know, opposite of what God wants. God wants you to have an abundant life, interlaced with a future and a hope. Satan wants to take that abundance from your life and give you penury and give you limitations and give you pain and misery. Misery loves company, they say. He wants to uh, fulfill his own purpose in your life. And many people miss the boat because they are totally unaware that they're in a warfare situation. They don't see the adversary thwarting their efforts. They don't see him throwing temptations their way because he's not you know, the picture with red horns and painted like, on, you, know, like you see on Halloween. Because they don't see that visible threat, they see the cloak of invisibility and they don't recognize that the enemy is at work in their lives, thwarting their efforts at every turn because he wants company where he's going. See, James chapter 4, verse six, 7 in the Amplified says this So submit to the authority of God, resist the devil. Stand firm against him and he will flee from you. Hallelujah. Because Satan is a defeated foe. We know how his story ends. You know, so all of these efforts in between, he achieves by bringing a cloak of invisibility. He's not there. You can't point to him, but he's acting. He's thwarting. He's against you at every turn. He's causing you to stumble, to falter. So knowing that we have an adversary 
is, it is very important in locating our purpose. If you're totally blindsided and you do not know that the adversary is there thwarting every effort, you will have a hard time locating your purpose. So you have to come up with the mindset that there is an adversary, one who is trying to make finding my purpose extremely difficult. Hallelujah. You know, but let's continue. You know, so now we've located our purpose. Now we uh, know that there's an adversary, but we need the church. Hallelujah. So ecclesia is the Greek word for the church, the body of Christ. Now in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, Bible says, do not forsake the assembling of ourselves, the church, together as is the manner of some. Some people say, oh, organized religion is not my thing. I don't want to be there. They're, you know, uh, hypocrites and that. Now, remember, if a hypocrite is standing between you and God, they are closer to God than you are. Think about it. It's just simple physics. If they're standing between you and God, if a hypocrite is standing between you and God, they are closer to God than you are. You know, so as is the manner of some, do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, but exhort one another. Iron sharpens iron so much more as do you see the day of judgment approaching. See, to leave to fulfill your purpose. Now, here is why you need the church. You cannot do it alone. You can't do it alone. The church and the body of Christ is here to help. You know, you cannot pursue your purpose alone. It involves others of a necessity. Your purpose, clarity of purpose, involves other people. You know, Proverbs chapter 15, verse 22 says this. Plans fail for the lack of counsel. But with many advisors or with many counselors, they succeed. So this is the synergy you know, that comes about when you are in the company of believers where the sum is, uh, the sum of its parts is greater than the whole. Everybody comes together and God infuses us with dunamis power and authority and you overcome anything that the adversary throws in your direction. So it's important in finding your purpose to remember that you cannot do it alone. You need other believers. Hallelujah. Now let's delve in a little more into the Ecclesia. And that is the notion of oneness. Hallelujah. Oneness. In the first Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 and 14, say, for us, the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many, are one body, so also is Christ. Verse 13, for by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, when G whether Jews or Greeks, whether slave or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. I mean, you can extrapolate and take this diversity as much as you want to, whether black or white, whether, you know, uh, poor or rich, whether young or old, male or female, you know, in any geopolitical uh, uh, spectrum, you know, in any orientation, all believers are to have a unity of purpose. See, God in Romans chapter 12 tells us, live peaceably, as much as it lies within you, live peaceably with all men. That is God's will for his children. So in finding your purpose, you know, in finding your purpose, you have to be able to live at peace with all men. Wherever you find yourself, people that don't look like you, people that don't pray like you, people that don't dress like you, people that don't have the same beliefs, that don't have the same value, you have to live at peace with them. Hallelujah. You know, so as we continue in this clarity, what is the believer to do? Now that you understand, what is the believer to do? And I want to bring it home with this, the apostolic dimension. You see, believer's purpose, every believer's purpose has an apostolic dimension. You say, what is the apostolic dimension? The apostolic is following in Christ's footstep. See, we're all on a journey to Christ's likeness. We want to be like Jesus. It is emulating that life of love 
and holiness lived on earth by the Son of God in order to save and to sanctify us. See, an example of this is the Apostle Paul. In Galatians 1, chapter, uh, chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, he says, but when he pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, verse 16, to reveal his son in me, that I may preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. It's a spiritual thing. See, Paul's popular title was a missionary to the Gentiles. Throughout, throughout his missionary life, he fulfilled that purpose. You know, so there is this apostolic dimension where you are to, on your journey to Christ-likeness, live an exemplary life, live the way that Christ lived. To what end? To the ministry of reconciliation. Hallelujah. And let's wrap up here. You see, reconciliation ministry. You know, Second uh, Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, uh, Paul was writing to uh, the young Timothy, his mentee, and he says, the, the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. See, Paul told Timothy to teach others what he had heard and learned so that after they learn it, they would also be able to teach others as well. This is what is called the ripple effect. So in your purpose, in your walk, you ought to teach others who in turn will teach others and teach others and teach others and continue for as long as the Lord tarries, this is his plan. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse 18 says, now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. So our purpose involves leading others to Christ by our testimony, by our witness, by our example. Hallelujah. Now remember Colossians 3.17 where it says, when you're, whatever work you find in your hand to do, do it as though you were serving the Lord, not your uh, human master. See, with that mindset, when you serve in any capacity, as though the Lord were your supervisor, you are leading by example. People draw inspiration from your calmness, from your kindness, from your ways, without saying a word. It was St. Francis of Assisi who says, you know, in life, always preach the gospel. If necessary, use words. What does this mean? You can preach without a word. You can preach with your acts of kindness with the way you treat people, with your forgiveness, with your temperament, with the way you deal with adversity, disappointments, with the way you rise up from affliction, with the way you, your positive energy and attitude, with the way you look at lives, stick to itiveness, with the way you pursue your goals, with the way you have this trust and implicit confidence in every situation, knowing that you have the victory. Hallelujah. So there is clarity of purpose for every believer. And I want to run through all of this again. First of all, understand that God has a, a purpose for your life. And that purpose includes having an abundant life. An abundant life. And know that he also has a, a purpose. God has a plan for your life that includes a future and a hope. But understand that as you work towards that purpose, that there's an adversary who doesn't want you to get there. You are in a warfare that you don't know. So why are you trying to locate your purpose? He's thwarting your efforts. If you're blindsided, you fall. But if you walk around with the understanding, God says in his word that you should resist, submit first to the authority of God, and then resist the devil, he will flee from you. And when he has taken flight, you come to another understanding and that you hold on to your brethren because you cannot do this alone. You cannot fulfill your purpose in God by yourself. You need the church, the body of Christ. And you must come with oneness in spite of your physical differences. There is a oneness. It's a unity of purpose that brings you all together. 
And lastly, there's an apostolic dimension to your purpose. And that apostolic dimension requires that you bring others to Christ by reconciliation. And it doesn't have to be by words. You don't have to stand on a podium. You don't have to get a microphone. Unless you are led to do that, you can lead people to Christ by your example, by your witness, by your testimony. Hallelujah. Now, it would be remiss of me to leave you without giving you an opportunity to make this God the Lord and Savior of your life. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 of the Living Bible says, For if you tell others with your own mouth that Jesus is your Lord and believe in your own heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Now, this promise endures. Whether you're praying with us now as we pray simultaneously in this broadcast or you're praying at a future date listening to this broadcast, the promise endures. All the prerequisites, all that's needed is for you to believe deep down in your heart, you know, and be truly repentant. Let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner. I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you've died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins and I invite you to come into my heart and life today. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. Amen and amen. And if you just said that prayer for the first time, welcome to the kingdom of God. I tell you, friend, there is such joy provoked in heaven over the one ship that was lost and is now found than the 99 that are there. See, God loves for us. This is the core of our purpose, is to bring people to the saving knowledge of the grace of God. But I love you too deeply to not leave you with some instructions. Amen? Hallelujah. See, there are three things that you must do. Talk to God every day. Believers call that prayer. You know, you say, talk to him about what? Everything that ails you, everything you care about, every need in your life, every dream, everything, fellowship with him, commune with God, talk to him through prayer. It's not always a, a, a request, you know, God is not always a, a, a request answering service or an insurance against fire. You talk to him in every way. And number two, read the Bible every day. God talks to you through his word. You say, how? The inductive power of, of, of the gospel, the letter, this eternal word of God that, is, that never passes away, answers and speaks to different situations. God begins to give you answers to situations, give you answers to the situations of those that he has assigned around you so that he talks to his word. Hallelujah. And number three, join a Bible-believing church and you will grow and mature into the purpose of God's calling in your life. Now, I welcome you to join us here at Grace Gate. You have a standing invitation where we preach the unadulterated word of God. Hallelujah. Thank God for his word today. Thank God for believers' clarity of purpose. I pray that you will not only be hearers of this word, but that you will be doers of it. Hallelujah. Let us pray.